still. Hiking at 20,000 feet? Or 17 or whatever no, it is? I'm <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah. But uh, no. after 7,000, I'm not much use. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I um, We're recording this for people that can't be here. Um, and putting it on the on the YouTube page um, for for later viewing and uh, I it, it's I listened to last week's and we could I could barely hear anything oh. and now this week's I've got peeking into the red zone so I don't, maybe this one will be un understandable for different reasons um, at any rate um, let's pray does anybody have anything that we need to want to pray about? or anything to, to lift up, good or bad, or indifferent. It's like that a new school near coming back. Yes, indeed. Good. Yes, indeed. Were you in the classroom futzing with stuff today? It's, it's professional development until next Wednesday when the kids come. Yep. So we're putting our school back together because it had to be freshened in the HVAC. Okay. So the guys are still there working, and we're working around them. Okay. Yeah, that's so. That's okay. fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. This is just a crazy, crazy busy time for me. Um. We're getting. We're in the stages of starting to get ready to open our Argyle, and we just got an offer accepted to expand our Craig Ranch site, and I've got 45 days to raise all the investor cash, and then this just popped up, and, and on top of several other things, so. Little, uh, the children got to get wiped. They got a lot of them right now. I, I told you I had $15. I don't know what you're... You know, I will take it. And then so worried about it. <laughs> might sell some of those kids. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Depending on the day, they don't go for much. <laughs> <laughs> you should pray for the folks up here in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. I got a bum knee. Just pray for that. <laughs> you fall off your bicycle? I did not fall off my bicycle. <laughs> well, I did fall off my bicycle, but that is not what hurt my knee. <laughs> well, it wasn't kickball, was it? I don't think so, although I hear that's a very dangerous sport to play. But I will say you did whine about it the entire ride last time. I did. <laughs> I did. But my riding part was really slow, so that was worth most of my whining. All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are gathered here tonight. In, in gratitude for being able to do so. We gather here with all manner of concerns, personal, business, global, and, and we offer them into your hands. You know the things that we've, um, we've dragged into this room unspoken uh, to one another, unspoken maybe even uh, to ourselves the stresses we carry around and do not acknowledge, the things that are um, weighing persistently upon us that, that we ignore. And so we just uh, pray, Lord, that you'd make us ever mindful of what is happening within and around us. We pray that in the midst of uh, so much chaos and so much grief that our joy would not be diminished, that our... Uh, our sense of wonder would not go away, but that we would remember, even in the midst of all that is difficult, that you remain with us, that you sustain our lives moment by moment. So we pray as we enter into this space yet again that, um, that you'd be uh, obviously present here with us, <clears throat> that you would lead our discussion, <clears throat> give us wisdom, Give us grace with one another, and uh, and be here now. All this we ask in the name and for the sake of Jesus, who is our Lord and our friend. Amen. Okay, so um, <clears throat> hi, and.
First question is, how'd your homework go? If you don't recall your homework, <laughs> your homework, uh, or if your dog ate it, uh, <laughs> your homework was to ask the question um, while ind indulging in some sort of news, uh, either a red article or the seven o'clock evening news with Walter Cronkite. Um, where, where is, where is Christ in this? How did it go? Did you struggle with the prompt? I'll start. Since I mentioned the turkey and Guy had a former homework assignment, I gave him that day. <clears throat> I mentioned, you know, the people who were living on the lower elevation, obviously, are the ones who've been hurt the most, and the more wealthy folks live on higher ground and are in better shape. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds me of an article I read at the Who um, in the Times that was talking about the friendship bias that seems to be a new factor in how uh, children of lower income families can find upward mobility. Mm -hmm. And it, it depends, you know, a lot on, I mean, a lot of the normal factors of where they grow up and whether they have a little money avoid eviction, all that stuff, but the schools have done a pretty good job where they do cross those boundaries, but not many do, um, effectively. But I love that it said, in God's own house, we, the church, shine in that we have a lot to teach other groups and um, uh, folks in other activities about how to employ that and to lift up and encourage folks, and we do it with cosplay scripts and, mm. but you know, just offering them an opportunity for an internship, or recommending them for an internship, or, you know, just trying to get to know them. So I thought that was really interesting and, you know, church, right? They actually mentioned the, yes. I scanned briefly that article yeah. that you're talking about. I did not see anything about the church. How about that? further down, a little <clears throat> paragraph, but it was good. Nice. So. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I I didn't. It wasn't a bad. Because <laughs> what strikes me when I watch the variety of news and stories that I see is how many people are working dutifully and reliably in our country to make things happen and, and to keep the lights on. And, you know, people talk about there's no service like that. Well, we haven't been in a power plant lately. I mean, they show up to work, you know, when they're doing their jobs. And when you listen to people interviewed on television, you can see that there are a lot of committed people working on whatever their individual projects are. And I find that encouraging. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any reflections? I saw a story on the news uh, of a boy who was born without hands and feet. And he loved baseball. And as a little guy, he would try to play. And then when he got older, he got artificial legs, but they didn't do anything you know, with his lack of hands. But he could still play baseball quite well. And he goes around now to uh, different places where they have disabilities or disabled kids and talks to them and explains what they can do mm. if they want to and if they try and mm. with God's help. Mm. So I thought it was yeah. it's doing a lot of good. Yeah. Because nobody understands like somebody who's grown mm. up. Yeah. And it also just speaks to our conversation about the, the mind body connection last mm -hmm. week as well, right? You decide you can't do anything and you probably can't. That's right. But if you decide you can, you probably yeah. can. Yes, who is it? I was encouraged by the story of that black man who was uh, accosted by a store clerk with racist language. And instead of reacting angrily or being terribly hurt, he proceeded to lecture the man about what was proper because his son was there listening to all this. And I thought, wow. Mm. Wow, because I am 
is so, I get angry, you know. And I, to have that kind of presence, to confront the person without anger, mm -hmm. just just gave him a nice little lesson, mm -hmm. lecture. You probably we're, listen we're, to my we're, sermon we're, on Sunday. Without <laughs> giving into his anger. Oh, yeah, 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 I, I read that and he said, oh, I was angry. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I held it down. Right? Yeah, he he it, didn't it, show it, it at all. Yeah, it, it wouldn't do any good. Yeah. Where did that happen? I don't know what city it was in. It was a large city. Somewhere. Yeah, it, uh, it was at Macy's, wasn't it? Or Dillard's? I don't know, but I don't know what city it was yeah. in. I think it hmm. was Dillard's. Dillard's, yeah. And they fired that man. Yeah, yeah they, they fired that man. Oh, good. Uh, right. The clerk. Well, we could probably narrow it down. There are, what, seven Dillard's left? <laughs> <laughs> we, we want to do we can figure it out. Well, thank you for sharing some of those things. Um, we are we're going to move along. Uh, I um, I I think that the heart of um, of any spiritual practice is awareness. So last week we talked about what that awareness looks sort of looks like, sort of externally, right? And put, putting a putting a fine point. On that, and we began with that sort of outer awareness because that is easiest for for most people, right? We look around. What is external to us? We are not, um, by nature or culture, um, very uh, introspective uh, people. We move fast. Um, we are preoccupied always. Um, there's always something trying to grab our attention. <clears throat> um, preoccupation doesn't necessarily mean that you're busy all the time, right? Some of you might not be. Um, but it means that there are um, there there is always something happening in your head that is distracting you from you or us, right? Um, always something to, to think about, or always something um, to uh, to keep yourself from from really paying attention to to you and and what you are really thinking and feeling. Um, you can be a, a completely alone and and preoccupied. Right, has nothing to do with with being in a grocery store or watching television or, or what have you. Um, so the next uh, practice that I am going to suggest for us is um, what I what I am going to call a, a gate a gate to life internal. <laughs> Get it? Life internal. So funny. Um, <laughs> And that is gratitude and humility. Um, these two concepts are, as far as I can tell, um, really uh, wonderful bedfellows. Um, and they are grounded concepts in our, in our faith, just in the Reformed faith in, in general. We'll talk um, a little bit tonight about why... Um, why gratitude and, and, and why humility are important at all, but I'm, we're gonna I'm gonna try to get us to humility by means of gratitude. It's what it boils down to, right? Um, but all of these, both gratitude and humility, um, uh, decenter us. They they move us out of the out of the very center of the story. And we do this in the Reformed tradition in in a number of ways. Um, so traditionally, we have what we call five solas. Um, in the Reformed faith, um, they are uh, sola is only in Latin or alone in Latin. So um, we've got Scripture alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone, and grace alone, and to the glory of God alone. And if you're thinking that's a lot of things to be saying that they're the only one, um, <laughs> you're right. I don't know why we chose that um, because you know normally when you say Something is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters, and there's only one of them. Uh, at any rate, all of these things decenter us, right? Our salvation, uh, it, uh, God's plan for the reconciliation of all things, isn't wrought at our hands alone. The five solas remember, remind us that God's plan to gather all things up in Christ, to reconcile all things, it comes by Christ alone, revealed fullest in the scriptures alone, 
through the gift of faith, all by an act of grace, all to the glory of God. Right? And none of these things are only mine. Right? Christ did it. The scriptures that I had no part in in collecting or writing uh, reveal it to me. Um, they come through the gift of faith, which is a gift, right? By grace, which in it by by grace's own nature is is something that I have not deserved, and also the glory of God, not to my own glory, right? Though I am very much a participant in all of it, right? I'm not left out completely. I'm just not the center of the story. All of these things that are at the very heart of the Reformed tradition decenter us. They try to teach us humility. How does our culture, how does our world, how do our desires, um, how do they all respond to such a decentering of you? Of your actions, of your will. That's our birth story, right? Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? Yeah. Well, I was saying the same as Maria. Mm -hmm. Self-sufficiency. People are just really proud of themselves for being self-sufficient. We are. Yeah. That's mentioned a lot in these disaster reports and everything. We thought we had it all together and we've lost it all. Mm -hmm. Lots of bootstrap pulling in our culture. Right? Uh, pull yourself up, and that's that's supposed to be a like a good thing, right? I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Did it? All. I'm the I'm a self-made man, right? Um, yeah, it, you know I, I don't think that the decentering of self is uh, you know at all the the primary cultural narrative, right? I, just, I thought it was interesting. Um, you know, our kids send these sorts of things. They do this sort of stuff. There's nothing wrong with this, right? Nothing at all, right? I want Lila to have a very healthy sense of, of who she is. And I want Elliot to have a very healthy sense of self-esteem. Um, but we center the individual, right? When I do this, I was born, I live in, you know, these are things that are fine for children to learn. <laughs> it's perfectly fine to read books about how I like myself. That, that, is, that is good and fantastic. Kids need to have a positive self-image. Um, at the same time, what we do with that message then, right, is to make them the center of the world. Yeah. That we can have healthy self-esteem and also not really westernize that sense of I am the center of my own world and everything should and ought to revolve around Right? There are lots of other people in the world, not in Western culture, who don't do that, right? who see themselves more as participants in a web of community that sustains itself by, the, by dint of lots of different players playing that role. Those people have a healthy self-esteem too. Right? They're just, it's that their sense of self-esteem is wrapped up in the collective, not only them. Right? It's, it's an us-ness rather than just a, a me, me, me. Um, John Bartz wrote um, that everyone is the hero of their own story. For us adults, right? This is this. When we leave childhood, it's not the only time that we get uh, a uh, a dose of it's all about you and should all, always be about you. Richard Dawkins, about you know what, 50 years ago now, wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, um, which right, which is a a, a story um, about how genetics essentially your genetics make you want to live. Everything on planet Earth is it wants to live. We're made to live more, right? That's why fish mate. It's why animals mate. It's you know you you thought that you wanted to mate just because you thought your partner was good looking. 
that's not why. You, you are created in that way to want to do that because that's what genes tell us to do. So it's interesting, right, that um, I don't know if our genetics predispose us uh, to being the hero of our own story or if the cultural story that we're telling is a reflection back on our genetics. Either way, we want to make more of ourselves. Right? <laughs> Duplication. Is there a difference between living more and living more fully? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But I'm not sure our bodies know that. right? I, and I'm not sure the culture really cares. It just wants you to be the center uh, of everything. Tell me what these things have in common. <laughs> It tastes, tastes good, except for the one Subway. Who would eat there every day? Oh my gosh! Make it your way. Make it yes. It's your way, right? Burger King, have it your way. That was and Burger King was saying that before we had things like, like Chipotle. Before Chipotle existed, which is, entire business model is you get to walk across the line and point to the things you want. Same with Subway, right? You point to the things you want behind the glass. If you want to pay a whole bunch of money for a salad, you can go to Salada and do the same thing. I remember the, the first the McDonald's and how exciting that was. That was way back in the ninth, early, excuse me, I was married in 1962, it was sometime after that. We were so excited to have that hamburger place so yeah. close and so cheap. Yeah. You know, there was what, 10 or 15 cents or a quarter? Yeah. I mean, it was really I don't want to poo-poo convenience, right? I don't want to poo-poo customization. I'm just saying that all of these things add up to a story that is about you, right? It, it predisposes us and sort of um, acclimates us to believe that we should always have it my way, right? And that when I don't, something has gone terribly wrong. And then there's the Frank Sinatra song. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm not sure um, that you know God is like angry at Chipotle. I'm not sure that that's the moral of the story here. Right? I don't. I think that you should probably have a burrito, however you want to have a burrito. But that is fine. It's just that. The cumulative effect of all of these things are, are pushing our souls in a certain direction, are warping us to be a certain way. Um, but there's an, uh, there's, there's, there's an alternative, uh, a holy one, I think, to a world in which you are the center of every story and have to be so. Um, and this is humility, uh, a, a proper confidence to be sure, in who you are and how you right, God, God, I feel like I mention this every week in worship, right? That you are infinitely loved by the beloved, right? There's there is nothing you could do to make God love you more. He loves you the most. Um, you, it, this is this is the very heart of God, and it is for you. Um, so, be confident in who you are, but know that. You aren't God's only beloved, right? <laughs> God's heart is bigger than just a, a burning desire for you. It is, uh, we are part of a people. Notice, by the way, in Scripture, um, this is why in the Reformed tradition especially, we talk a lot about covenantal language. Covenants are made with people, groups, right? It's very much God says, I commit to you, Israel, right? And to, to the point of my sermon this coming week, God also says things like, or Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, right? Groups of people. Very, very, very infrequently does Jesus say, Woe to you, Dawn, right? <laughs> he very rarely calls individuals out. It's almost always groups of people, right? It's because we are... We are one, right? In so many ways, our proclivities toward and against, uh, or toward and away from God, our proclivities toward pride or humility, these are things that happen to us as groups because we live together, we affect one another. 
I did a very quick and dirty um, search for verses that talk about humility. You will not be surprised to hear that there are many, many of them. So let's read a few. I'll start, and you can read as you can read them. How about that? Just read the next one. This is Proverbs. The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with the humble is wisdom. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. I got more. This is it. This is the last page. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This next one is only a fragment. We can skip it. humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. He has told you, O oh man, O oh mortal, is a better translation, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Proverbs really likes the phrase, but humility comes before honor, because in the next one, in from chapter 18, before destruction, a man's heart is haughty, proud, but humility comes before honor. And finally, a favorite of the evangelical church in America, anybody? If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray <clears throat> That is, but a time, are you, you were impressed with your eyesight? I am. <laughs> so, humility is a persistent theme throughout all of the scripture. Um, the contemplatives, however, love Mary as, as the mother of, of contemplatives, right? She is... Um, uh, central image of what it looks like to be humble. And they use Mary's song for this. This is Luke 1. And Mary said, my soul... By the way, recall what has just happened to Mary. Young unwed girl gets visited by an angel who tells her she's going to be impregnated out of wedlock by the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. Right? That, that God will so overshadow her in such a powerful way that new life crops up within her. Didn't ask for it. Was not on the texture plan. Right? Has plans to be married to a guy and named Joey. And everything was going so well. And then, and Mary said this. What the heck are you doing to me? Just kidding. <laughs> Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on, on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and, his, and to his descendants forever. If you didn't get, well, let's go back here. Um, what does the scripture have to say about um, the proud in First Peter? It's the last, next to last one. That God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Right. Um, and again, James quotes that one. He likes that one. Um, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom. Before destruction, a man's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. Jesus says things like, and the first will be last, and the last will be first, right? And here we get Mary, <clears throat> who embodies all of this in, in a really powerful way. Mary believes that um, what has happened to her is an honor. gratitude. She sees herself as lowly, that God has raised her up. Right. Do you get a sense that Mary sees herself as the sole hero or heroine of this story? No. no. The last couple of verses help us with that, right? Mary sees herself as part of not just Right? He has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant, me, but he has helped his servant, Israel. Mary sees herself as part of a body, part of a whole, that, that she is playing a role here, right? But she's not the only one. This is not just for Mary's sake, but for the for Israel's sake and for the sake of the whole world. Right? She brings up the promise that was made to their ancestors. She sees herself as part of the whole. It isn't just about Mary. And Mary is blessed because of this. Mary could have chosen to see that as a curse, right? But she doesn't. Mary puts herself in a place of humility, of understanding that maybe she doesn't have all the answers, maybe that she's going to allow her mind to be transformed to receive whatever has happened to her as at least possibly being a gift, right? Maybe it's too much to ask to receive everything as a gift, but she's open to it. She knows that at least in this in this heavenly visitation that she's she's been, something marvelous has happened to her. Pride bad, humility good, right? But what does humility do for us? I have a couple. Humility directs our hearts to an infinite God rather than to the finite race, resources that we have, right? We might believe that we are self-made people. We are wrong. We are people who are part of a whole. If we rely only on ourselves, we will find the limit of our resources. <clears throat> All of you have probably been at the end of your a time or two, right? Um, we can talk about how self-made we are and how great we are until the crap hits the fan, and then we realize just how finite our resources are, and then we have to start looking elsewhere. And if and if we are proud, right, that comes to us as a shock, and as the Lord cutting us down, right, the Lord opposing us in our pride. But if if we are humble. We have a different experience of that, right? We, it doesn't come to us as a surprise that we're at the end of a rope. Of course we are at the rope. We have this much rope, right? I don't have that much rope to begin with. It doesn't take me much to find the end of it. Humility makes us cooperators with God, right? 
Mary gets to be a participant with God rather than doing her own thing. Right? Humility is a path to wisdom. The, the Proverbs teach us that. You can't really learn to be wise if you aren't open to learning to be wise, can you? Right? None of us can. Uh, we were, I was just talking with some friends of mine the other day about a, um, a professor that we had in seminary. His name was Dr. Stephen Toole. He's an Old Testament professor, and he looked like a leprechaun. And he dressed as a leprechaun every year, every year for, for Halloween. Um, and uh, he was known, he recently retired, but he was known for his like big bellowing, bellowing laugh. Right? He just found so much delight in the scripture, and in his, his particular favorite thing was Isaiah. And he just found so much delight in the book of Isaiah. And he would, you know, the, oh, 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 and he would just be cracking himself up in class. <laughs> but the thing that all of us loved about Steve Toole was not just that he was like a jolly good fellow, but that he also found, I mean, this is a man who has, you know, he's come to like the end of his career, not only like in time, but also in education. He's got a PhD. What, are the, what else? He's got the terminal degree in his field. But every time he would learn something new, he would delight in that. He wasn't ashamed to have learned something new. He would delight in the fact that he learned something new. Can you believe this? Look what we found. Right? It's really wonderful. And if you are a proud person, that that is difficult. If you know everything already. What's the, where's the joy in that? But anyway. Humility also leads to the death of your ego, <laughs> um, which is something that the mystics talk about constantly um, and something we will get to in a, in a week or two. Um, but if I can kill that part of me that wants everything to be about me all the time, then I am opened up to this more connected way of seeing the world. right? If, if everything isn't just about me, or if I can at least get to marry, right, that it's maybe just not about me, but even just about my people, right, that opens me up to the sense that God cares about me deeply and desperately. God also cares about other people, right, and my affection, my actions affect them. My lack of, uh, of participation in what God is doing affects other people, right? This is how systems work. Um, We'll, again, we'll talk a little bit that, about that on Sunday. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll move on. Um, and the bonus is that people just will like being around you more. <laughs> and not for nothing, I think that you will deal well or deal better with difficult people um, if you can find something. Because a lot of times, when you're dealing with people and they're upset about something, and it feels like they're upset with you, they're not upset with you. They got something going on, right? And if we can be humble, I think it is one more step to realizing that like the world doesn't revolve around you. Maybe they actually are mad at you and they're directing all their anger at you. Chances are it's not really about you, right? Unless you've obviously did, like you ran over their cat, like. <laughs> That's, that's about you. Like, get it together, right? Use your, use your mirrors. But chances are you didn't go out of your way to, to be ignorant to somebody, and they're just giving you, reading you the riot act. Well, chances are they're just not a very humble person themselves, right? Somebody stopped in the office today and told me that their first day in class, as a teacher, they've already had one parent complaint. Oh, good <laughs> Kids aren't in school yet. <laughs> well, they've already had a parent complaint. Right? Wow. That parent didn't get what they wanted. Yes, Janet. And that's where you ask the question, if you're just having a bad day, or are you always just having a bad day? But it's not about you, right? That's not, that's not about what this teacher did or didn't do. Right? Matter of fact, the complaint was completely out of her control. She didn't have anything to do with it. Um, yeah. A 
little humility for us goes a long way in understanding the, the pride of other people. Because it's in us too, right? Pride is in me. It's in you. We all are fighting this sense of ego-centered living. Um, but it doesn't do us any good. And the more that we can deal honestly with it, um, the better we can we can deal with other people. Um, so if we're working toward humility, and we know that pride is a bad thing, how do we get there? Because be humble is bad advice. <laughs> no, nobody, it's, you, you can't you can't get there that way. Um, so how do we do it? I think we do it by gratitude. I think gratitude is a gateway, not the gateway, a gateway um, into, into, humi into humility. Gratitude has a multiplicity of benefits on its own. Research has shown that gratitude uh, boosts your immune system. Gratitude bolsters your resilience to stress in your life. Gratitude lowers depression. It increases feelings of energy, determination, and strength. It even helps you sleep better at night. All of these things are research-confirmed benefits of, of humility. In fact, uh, few things have been so empirically vetted and studied than the, the connection between gratitude and overall happiness and well-being. The reason that I would like to suggest it uh, to you is because it is very simple. <laughs> it, it, all of you know how to be grateful, right? You understand what gratitude feels like. Um, you understand how to be grateful. But here's why I think, here's the underlying reason that I believe that gratitude is, is a, a, a way to kill our pride and a, and a gateway into humility. It's that to be grateful, at least in part, implies that you know that you didn't have everything to do with the thing that you're grateful for. Right? It is this way for us to almost accidentally decenter ourselves, to move us out of the center. If I am grateful for the warmth of a day <laughs> right now, <laughs> somebody <laughs> described being outside in the wind to me as being in a convection oven, yeah. <laughs> and I about died. Um, but imagine what a 75 degree morning might feel like. And you walk outside and you say, wow, like that, that is hitting the spot. What a wonderful gift. Right. Thank you. Did you have anything to do with that? Nada. If you are, I am sure at some point in the next, you know, hour and an hour, hour, when I get home and I'm putting my kids to bed, I will um, likely be really annoyed with them and likely be very delighted with them. Both of those things are likely to happen to me in the next hour. Possibly at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, what did I have to do? I, d I played a part in the ways that they're, gonna, they're going to delight me, but I didn't play all the parts, right? They're their own little people, right? Um, all the things that we are grateful for. When we're grateful for things like jobs and or retirement funds that are getting us through or the houses that we live in, like all of these things, none of them, if we're grateful, for, say for a job or a career that we had, like everything that happened to you in your, in your career, are you willing to take complete and full responsibility that you did it all? Right. Just made some lucky guesses. Is that right? <coughs> Only so, the good what's that? Only the good parts. Only the good parts. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's, it is the case that, like, all of, I mean, the, so much of our life is, feels like happenstance or <coughs> happens because somebody else, we knew somebody else. Like, it, there are so many intertwining, overlapping um parts to life that, that it's almost impossible for us to take sole responsibility for nearly anything that happens to us in life. And that is true, good or bad. But gratitude for that thing
helps to decenter us from the middle of our story where everything revolves around us because of us. You see the trick of gratitude? Godwin, are you going to say something? Yeah, I, uh, having been given this guidance before, I once had a practice that I completely forgot about until you brought this up, which was every night to think of three things I was grateful for and either write them down or record. So I had a recorder and I would do it. And I, I found that I, I started to look forward to that every evening. And when I was really at my best, I would call the people after I thought about it and say, hey, I'm grateful for you. Well, I'm going to need you to stop talking because <laughs> you're ruining my homework. <laughs> There's always something, something to be grateful for. Might not be everything. It probably isn't everything. Name one thing you're grateful for. One thing. Go ahead. Gift of life. Life, living, great. My mom. Yeah. Aw. Air conditioning. Air conditioning. <laughs> Fantastic. Drive me crazy. There you go. Being able to help. Yes. Great. There's always something. And if you can't think of anything, think about this. These are my grounding ones. On the days when I can't think of anything to be grateful for, I'm always grateful for the fact that we have an earth that of its own accord, because God made it so, gives us everything that we need. Right? Isn't that wonderful? Nobody told the earth. We didn't have to make the earth do it. She just grows things, right? It's incredible. And if 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 the earth stopped doing that, we would all be cooked. We would be cooked. The earth is everything for us, and it comes to us completely as gift, completely and totally as gift. Let me show you a picture of the people who taught me more about gratitude than anybody I've ever learned anything from. In uh, 2008, uh, Colleen and I, baby Colleen and Jay, um, is, can, can you pick us out of that lineup? <laughs> um, we, uh, we went to Malawi, and these folks that we were with prayed constantly, constantly. Little prayers. Get in the car. And, you know, the roads are terrible and people drive like maniacs. So, But they were praying. Lord, give us safe travels. And then when we arrived, whether it was 15 minutes down the road or five hours down the road, they would pray, Lord, thank you for safe travels. We were just mindful of, like, everything that we did. Asking God's blessing into it. Thanking God for a good result or a bad result or whatever happened. One time we got in a wreck. It was terrifying. We were in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. Thank God for doing so. Everybody got there alive. Um, that taught me more. They didn't, they, didn't teach, they weren't teaching us anything, but it taught me more than uh, any lesson on gratitude that I've ever gotten. It was just watching them live and participating with them for a couple of weeks. Um, that was also the trip uh, on which I ate a rat. Oh, 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 dear. It has hair on it. Oh, it was gross. Not as gross as Joe. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but gross. I'll be sure to pass that along. But gross. <laughs> but gross, nevertheless. Um, also, I need to tell you that the auto text on that, I don't know if you know this, but when you when you grab a picture and you put it into a PowerPoint, it auto texts for accessibility in the case that... Um, Somebody needs to, or the picture won't load or whatever, it'll give you a, a auto text, this is what this picture is. And the, the auto text that came up um, when I put that in there was uh, a person eating a sandwich in a car. Anyway, so here's the deal though. If you get in the practice of naming the things, being mindful of the things that you are grateful for, Gratitude creates a mindset, right? It really is. Gratitude is an attitude. It sounds super cheesy. But because there is always something to be grateful for, it eventually creates a mindset in you of, of gratitude, right? You become a different person in a lot of ways. And as we talked about last week, what happens up here matters. It's like the placebo effect is just a real effect 
it's not fake because it it uh, it isn't it, it isn't you know chemically real. Real things happen because of the ways that you change your thinking, right? Well, real verifiable things happen. Yes. And that's like there's always something to complain about, and we know those people too. For sure. And they always seem to be unhappy. And so uh, yeah, it, it, it's a state of mind. It is, yeah. and, and I think it was. I'm about to share a quote from Merton. Merton also said that there is no space between gratitude and ingratitude. You are either a person who is grateful or you're a person who is not grateful. And those two create different people, right? They make different humans. And you know them, right? You know a grateful person. You know an ingra ungrateful person. And those things those things matter. They, they create an attitude and an orientation of life that is either really pleasant or really not. That pleasant, um, yeah. Gratitude will become a mindset. Mindset that even in hardship, um, you 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 can find things to be grateful for. I was just talking to somebody today <clears throat> about a, a, they're going through this really hard time, <clears throat> and uh, and they said, you know, this is really hard, and it's really been humbling. And I know I'm supposed to be thankful for that. I'm having a hard time with it. All right. At least they could recognize that that is true. Right. That's the first step. It's the first step. Also knowing, my mom says this all the time, all her life, is this too shall pass. Yep. Yep. So there it goes. Yep. Merton said this. One of the most important and most neglected elements in the beginnings of the interior life is the ability to respond to reality, to see the value and the beauty in ordinary things, to come alive to the splendor that is all around us. Right? He's talking about gratitude. Pay attention. How do you become how do you become mindful? How do you pay attention? Other than to make it a practice, right? To make it a spiritual practice that is gratitude. Um, so here, here, here you go. Here's this is not a progression, but here's what can happen, because nothing. By the way, nothing in the spiritual life is ever like somebody tells you they got seven steps to your spiritual development. They are a liar and a fraud. <laughs> there are never seven steps, or maybe there are seven steps, but you walk through them one, six, two, seven, five, four, three, right? Yeah. Did I hit all those numbers? I think no. I did. No, I think I did. Um, <laughs> But here's how it could happen. You could start at gratitude, and gratitude could begin to change you in a lot of meaningful ways. And, and as gratitude and your sense of being gratitude, being grateful to somebody else, to God, to other people, begins to decenter you in your own ways of thinking, well, guess what? You're on your way to humility, right? That is what humility is, is getting you out of the way. And, and allowing God to, to speak in and through you, which will make you more like Christ. That's why I keep talking about humility. Even Christ was humble, right? Remember, Luke twenty two forty two 42 is up here on the screen. Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, knows he's about to die, knows he's about to be murdered. He says, Father, if you're willing, if you are willing, remove this cup. I don't want to do this yet. Same time. Not my will, but yours be done. Right? Jesus, Jesus decenters himself to the will of God. This is what's going to happen. I'm going to walk through it as well as I can. It will also be the case that you will become a more soulful person. I read Richard Rohr write that, that the soul is, is actually just your divine likeness. You ever hear somebody talk about uh, uh, how that person doesn't have a soul after things they've done? whatever. I, I, I don't know if they don't have a soul, but if we've so marred our divine likeness, it is as though we don't have a soul, right? If we've so turned away from the ways that God has created us to live and to be, it is, it is as though we are soulless. But to be more soulful, to be more like Christ, is to embody this humility that has a proper confidence, right? Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew what he could do. Jesus didn't have to do that, but he did. In the same way, by the way, pride, especially for people who have options, right? 
Um, we don't have to be humble. Nobody's forcing you to be humble. Except for that it's going to make you a, a more Christ-like, more happy, in a lot of ways, um, person. A more soulful person. Gratitude is a gateway into humility. Gateway, a gateway. Not the only one, but a gateway into humility. And humility is a very important central concept in becoming a person who is like Christ, a spiritual person. Pride will ruin it all. If you read Augustine, he'll tell you that. Augustine believed that, that pride was the sin, the one from which all of the others sprouted. Um, and he said that he said that pride is really it, it, you use different language that I'm using about decentering a person, but, but uh, Augustine saw pride as the weight of one's loves directed toward the self, and an, an entanglement. If the, if one's love is directed toward God in humility, then then we will move toward God, and toward God's light, towards God's will. But if we are if we have uh, an unnecessary amount, I guess, uh, of self-love, where we, we value our own opinions, our own um, desires above what, what, God, what it is that God has for us, if, if those are wrapped around us, well, you know, you get the image, right? You top load. Here's your homework. <laughs> Create a dang gratitude journal. Do it on your phone. Do it. On actual paper, you've got a, a phone that can probably take notes. Um, so open up your notes app and, uh, and 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 scribble in there. You don't have to do it every day, by the way. Um, research shows that uh, you get the same effects if you do it twice a week. So you can do it every day if that's what you need to do to remember. Um, or I bet your phone sets reminders too. Um, so tell your phone to tell your to, to remind you. Um, to do those things. When you feel grateful, see why I wanted you to shut up, God? When you feel grateful, express that gratitude either to God or to the person that you feel grateful to, right? It's a, it's a wonderful thing. No one will ever be mad at you for calling or texting to say, you know, I'm really thankful for that thing that you did uh, and I'm thinking about you today. You will not have anger on the other side of the line. And if you do, that person's <laughs> going through something. <laughs> okay? Um, yes. Express it because it is the, your expression of it. You have to do. Uh, otherwise, gratitude is not a practice, right? It's just a feeling. You got to do something with that feeling to make it a practice for it to matter at all. So it, if, if you feel it, express it because that will remind you that it's not just about. <clears throat> You didn't make it happen. God made it happen. Somebody else in your life made it happen. Express it. Say thanks. Even if that is a one-second acknowledgement uh, of God's presence in your life. God makes it all. God does make it all. God makes does. It all happen. That's right. That's right. This morning I was grateful for a young man who was weeding the yard. He was a worker for the HOA. And he... Came, and I was sitting on the back porch thinking it was a nice day to do that, but it really wasn't. I was sweating at 7 in the morning. But he uh, he poked his head over and, and he started talking to me. We had the best talk. He was the same young man that had come to my door. Well, I had fixed a, a broken spot in the sidewalk. And he had asked me if I'd ever heard of Elvis Presley. He <laughs> 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 was Hispanic and he was about 20. And he... He just had real. He uh, had been to the Elvis Presley movie that was out that I didn't see, but he really thought I should go see it. Oh. <laughs> it was. He was. It, I just thought how neat he is, and he did that this morning. Not talk about Elvis, but just talked about this morning and how hot it was and everything. And, mm. You know, and have a good day, ma'am. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So throw that in your gratitude journal later this week. And finally, note instances of ingratitude or envy, comparison. Uh, 
we're, we're not technically allowed uh, to quote him anymore, um, but there was a comedian who said uh, that the only time that you're allowed to look into your neighbor's bowl is to make sure that they have enough. Right? Um, it's not helpful in a lot of ways to compare ourselves to others. Although some, some psychologists will tell you that comparison can be really helpful sometimes if you, com if you compare yourself knowingly to people who are doing worse than you are. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but yeah, comparison, envy, ingratitude. Make note of when you feel these feelings and intentionally pair them with an, an instance of gratitude in your life. Maybe it can be about the same thing. That will be helpful. If you've, got, if you've gotten the thoughtfulness to do that, do that. Um, but yeah, this, this, is your, this is your homework uh, for the week. 7.32. Yeah, okay. I'm telling you. <laughs> I, 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 we, were, we were flying tonight. Um, anybody got a comment or a question? Are you grateful that I can't find a seat for everybody? I'm so grateful. I'm so, so grateful. All right. Next well, week. Thank you. Yeah, you. Oh, next week we're off because we've got pizza. It's the first day of school, and so we've got pizza and games. Uh, and I think there's going to be popsicles too. So you can come play games with us next week down in the NPR. We'd love to see you. Anyway, grace and peace. I'm going to